All right, this is the creative style and picture profile chapter. Those two things can change your image a lot. Um, for instance, you could have two people with the exact same camera standing right next to each other, shooting the exact same scene. One might be using one creative style, one might be using a picture profile, and the results can come out looking incredibly different. So I think this is one of the most one of the most important chapters um, in terms of getting the look of your camera the way you want it to. All right, at this point, I need to give a big warning label, a uh, big disclaimer. If you're like me, you're a jack of all trades, so you shoot, you edit, you direct, you do the audio, you do the color grading, you, you, you publish it, you give it to the client, you do everything, um, which might imply that you're a master of none. If you're like me, I am not a professional colorist. I, am, I have not mastered color grading. So there's a possibility that I might say something wrong in this section, and if, or I might give a wrong recommendation. Now, anytime I give a recommendation in this section, I'm gonna try very hard to give examples of why I'm recommending it that way. And you could look at it and say, you know, I think Dave's wrong, or maybe Dave's right. Um, now I've watched four or five different color grading um, paid courses. I even have a great opportunity to look at professional colorists and watch them over physically over their shoulder and watch how they do things. They all do it a little bit differently. I've watched a lot of different courses, um, how they apply the LUT, how they pre-treat the LUT, what do they do after the LUT, even if they use a LUT. So when, especially when we get into the S-Log section. Um, now if you're a beginner, I would say definitely stay with the CS or the creative style, which we're gonna talk about next. Once I get to the PP or the picture profile area, I would say skip it. And let's say you're a brand new beginner. Um, you've never used this camera before. I'd say, you know, if you shoot a lot, come back in like maybe a month or two. If you don't shoot, maybe you're a weekend warrior. You shoot maybe once a weekend. Uh, maybe come back in six months and then watch the chapter on picture profiles. This part, definitely watch. But when I tell you to skip ahead, definitely skip ahead if you're a total beginner. All right, now we're getting to the fun part. We'll talk about creative styles. Um, right now I'm shooting in the standard creative style. And the first thing that you'll see in the creative style is contrast. You have contrast, saturation, sharpness, a lot of different things we're gonna cover here shortly. But the first thing, one of the most important is contrast and how that affects your image. And you'll notice that I opened up the blinds. So I have a very high dynamic range scene here. Um, you'll notice like in that closet right there or back there where my printer is, actually I turned the light on, I opened the blinds up. Um, we're well exceeding what this particular creative style can handle. And I'm starting at its best, meaning the negative three. Um, well, you'll see as I increase it that it's gonna get worse. All right, this is a negative two. It's probably subtle, but you'll notice that the uh, the blacks, especially in the speaker and the closet, have gotten darker, and the highlights have gotten a bit more blown out. All right, now we're at a negative one. You'll notice that the midtones are staying pretty constant, but what's happening is that the the whites are getting more blown out and the blacks are getting blacker. Now we're at the default zero contrast. So this is kind of how it comes out of the camera. Um, and as you can see, the closet's getting even darker and the whites are getting even more blown out. Plus one. Now you'll start to actually notice on my face, I'm starting to notice on the monitor, that the shadows on my face, um, the way I have it lit, and maybe under here, are becoming darker. All right, now we're at a plus two. And one other thing I wanna include here is, we're gonna get into saturation later, but as you add contrast in this camera, you're adding saturation. There's other cameras like the GH4, as you add contrast, it does not add any, any saturation. So you gotta be really careful with this camera because as you pump up the contrast, you can see that my skin is getting more saturated. If we were to look at it, a vector scope and the, like the blues are getting uh, a more saturated blue basically. Plus three, we're at the highest contrast we can go. So you can see like, there's, I, we've lost a lot of detail in the closet. Uh, the speaker grill right here, we've lost a lot of detail. There's actually a line right here going across here. You can normally see, I can barely make it on monitor. And pretty much now everything in the in the window is totally blown out. And as you can see, my face have gotten much more saturated, um, maybe too saturated. And like the blues, I don't have much color in this particular scene. I've actually got a light on that back wall. Um, I don't know if I can cover it, but that light is got a blue gel on it, and uh, you can see it's getting a bit bluer. So now I'm going to switch back. 
All right, now we're at a negative three, and you'll say, whoa, there's a big difference going from plus three to negative three, isn't there? There's a lot. So that's kind of going back to my first recommendation of always go to negative three, almost always. I'm gonna show you some instances where you don't wanna to go to negative three. But you'll notice we got information in my neighbor's house right there, at least in dark. And remember, we got super whites, so we can actually recover some of these um, later. Uh, the grill here, we can actually see right here along here, we can see that there's a line dividing it. So that's good. So what I'm gonna do really quickly, also you'll notice the saturation in my skin is down a bit. So I'm gonna probably need to bring up the saturation a little bit. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna close the blinds. With the blinds closed, we pretty much eliminate any blown out highlights. The only thing that's close, it's right at 100. I was just looking at the blue channel of my white shirt. It's pretty close to clipping, but again, we have some recovery. So what I do is show you how easy it is, because I'm looking at the monitor now, without any of those blown out highlights, um, I would probably want to even add contrast in that last scenario. But this scenario, I'm looking at it, I could probably use a little bit of saturation, maybe bring up the blues a little bit, maybe just add a little bit of contrast. And I'm gonna show you how easy it is in post to do that. It's a quick one slider move, basically. It's gonna be real simple. I'm just gonna take the contrast here and uh, resolve light, or it used to be called light, so it's a free version, and I'm just gonna increase it. And as you can see, what I usually do is I go too far and I come back. I go too far, come back, and kind of find that happy spot in the middle. And there's a pivot point. I can actually change the pivot point of the contrast curve. And so here is before and after. Before and after of adding contrast. And so shooting at a negative three gives you that um, added benefit of just adding contrast really quickly in post later, which is fantastic. And I'll show you why. So let's go to the other one. Here is the one with the, the blinds open. And we've, you can see we're clipping the window totally here. It's above 100 IRE. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring down the curves adjustment and recover those super whites, because we got some extra information that we can recover. And sure enough, if I zoom way in, you can see my neighbor's house, if I turn this on and off, this curves adjustment, we've recovered quite a bit in the house, which is fantastic. So let's bring this back up here. So now what I'm gonna do is add contrast back in after I've recovered that. And actually you can see right here, the blacks are being clipped as well. We can recover some of those as well. Just bring those up a little bit. And then we're just gonna to go to the contrast curve and increase the contrast, maybe about right here. And then we'll change the pivot point. We're gonna bring that up. Maybe to about right here. Try with the contrast again. And then here is the before and after. So we recovered a lot of those highlights in the um, my neighbor's house. And we've also recovered some shadows right here in the speaker as well. So now let's go ahead and do kind of the same thing, but I'm gonna do it even faster in Premiere Pro. This is their color tab, their brand new color tab. So let's take, for instance, this shot, and I'm gonna take the plus three version of that same shot. Um, so this is the minus three, and all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna increase contrast. And once it updates, there it goes, I'm pretty much done. Um, obviously, I'm gonna, I could bring, recover some of the highlights down like that. Um, I could play around with some of these other features, but for the most part, I just wanna get the idea of that's how fast it is. You can just recover the highlights, um, add some contrast, and you're for the most part done. I mean. Obviously this, this is a very quick grade. So now what I wanna, the whole reason I'm doing this is I wanna compare this to the plus three. So I could try and recover some of the highlights. I'm not gonna be able to recover as much because it um, blew out more. Um, and then I don't need to add contrast here, but what I'm gonna try to do is recover some of the shadows. And you can see right here on the, um, See how that there's a hard line right there and that's it's gone. There's no information below that. So I can't really cover too much in the shadows. So I'm gonna actually bring up the shadow slider. Um, I can't bring it up too much and then it starts affecting my skin tones. I don't wanna affect it too much. So let's say we bring it up here. Or even if we tried to, um, another way to do it would be lock off the curves adjustment and just kind of bring up the shadows here. Um, I that's about as much as I can do without making the image go totally wonky. So now here's the big comparison. So here's minus three and here's plus three. Now what I want you to do is when I go back and forth, look at the window and look at the speaker. So here's minus three 
see all the detail in the, the speaker and there versus no detail. Detail, no detail. Minus three, plus three. Minus three, plus three. And if you, you're thinking to yourself, well, maybe I want a little more contrast here, it's easy. You just go here and just add a little bit more contrast. Or you can actually not only do it there, um, if you really want more contrast, you can add more of an S curve, like right here. But the thing, the point I'm trying to get across here is you will, you're going to have more information in the highlights and the shadows um, doing it this way than you would doing it this way, um, having more of a baked in look. So it just gives you more options later in post. That's why I'm recommending shooting at a minus three. All right, next up, I'm going to show you when it's a really good thing to add contrast when you have a real low contrast situation. Here we are at a negative three. It's a lot, really long distance shot. We're going to step up to a negative two here. This is shot with uh, about 300 millimeters. Uh, negative one, and we're going to go to zero. And as you can see, as we step up, here's plus one. You can see the trees. There's more definition in the clouds. Uh, sometimes it's better to get it right in camera when it comes to this. Here's plus three. I'm going to go back down. Here's what it was at negative three, and here it is with a plus three. So sometimes it's better off just to get it right in camera when you have a really low contrast situation. All right, next up, we're gonna talk about saturation. And remember, contrast, as you increase contrast in this camera, you increase saturation. Right now, we're at a negative three contrast, and I'm at a negative three saturation. Um, right here, we have the DSC Labs one shot. It's about 99 bucks. Uh, it's an excellent investment. It's a great learning tool. It'll get you a lot of jams if you use this, especially in mixed lighting situations where you need to get the color back to where it should be and white balance and a whole bunch of different things. So it's got a bunch of different things on here. Let me explain really quickly. Uh, you'll see, especially if I rotate it that way, I have a really high re reflective black area on the top right or a top left on your side. Anyway, the black area, um, that's great for white balancing in the blacks. So sometimes the blacks can be different than the grays. You can see we got gray and then we got white and then those three patches in the middle, those are your skin tones. So those should line up on your vector scope um, pretty well. And then on the other side, we have all the different colors that uh, are in the vector scope, the grati graticules, I believe that's what they're called, those little boxes. And we can aim or get these lined up. Now, this particular chart, the colors are on purpose, they're desaturated by a half. So when you bring them in your vector scope, they're not going to go right into your boxes. Um, but there are a lot of programs like DaVinci Resolve. They could just say 2x, so you're doubling the saturation. And then they should go right to the boxes and you can line things up correctly. And we're going to demonstrate that here in a minute. But right now, I just want to, we're going to step through all the different saturation levels. Um, this is a negative 3. All right, this is a negative two saturation. You'll notice the colors are starting to come up a little bit. All right, and this is a negative one saturation. Now here's my recommendation on saturation, and I'm gonna kinda reinforce this later when we bring this into post. As you increase the saturation, you increase, increase the likelihood that you're going to blow something out. Now, probably the only thing in this particular scene that's going to get close to being blown out is the blue channel on my white shirt. That's the thing I'm probably worried about the most right now because it's starting to go above the 100 line. I'll be able to recover some of it, but I don't know if I can recover all of it. So as you increase the saturation, you do run into the risk of blowing out a red channel, especially like on the highlights in my skin right here. You can see it's going up, but there's not that much saturation in my skin, so I'm not too worried about that. But you're doing an interview. If you put the set, push the saturation too much, you're gonna clip it. You won't be able to get information back later. So my first recommendation is if you're really worried about clipping, I would keep it at negative one. I wouldn't go to negative two or negative three saturation because we're dealing with four to zero. We don't have a ton of color information. Do we wanna throw it all away? I don't know. Again, I'm not a professional colorist here, but where I leave it most of the time is actually on zero unless there's something in the shot, like a red shirt or something like that is just glowingly too um, saturated and I know it's going to clip. All right, now we're at the default saturation of zero on this camera. The A7S, which is kind of a different sensor, I usually leave that one at a minus one, but this one works pretty well at its default zero setting. Like I said before, 
by 95% I leave it on this one and if I worry about something in the shot clipping then I'll usually lower it to a negative one. Now we're at plus one. Um, things could be clipping in my shirt. I'm not sure and as you can see we see a lot more colors in the chart. All right now we're at a plus two and as you can see my skin is probably at the point now where it's getting a little bit too saturated. All right now we're all the way up to plus three on the saturation. About the only time I use plus three is when I'm trying to find color cast. Um, what I'll do is just boost the saturation all the way up and then it becomes very obvious to me you know like oh there's too much green in the image because I'm using these fluorescent um, lights and I've pulled the green out by going to magenta uh, on the color shift and we're going to demonstrate more about that later but um, you can see my skin is very saturated the blue is very blue and as you can see the colors are very saturated all right sharpness the in-camera sharpness for this camera in the crop mode at 4k is exceptional it's fantastic um, I would call it as good as the algorithm that you'd find in Premiere Pro, the sharpness slider. It's that good. Now that wasn't the case with Canon cameras. Uh, the general thought process with Canon cameras at the time was to bring the sharpness all the way down and then you would add sharpness later because you, were, you would fear aliasing and more halo patterns of starting to appear and it was very true because if you kept the Canon camera at like its default zero setting you, halos would appear like around a blade of grass. Um, each one kind of had this kind of weird thing going around it and then all of them would start to shimmer and shake with this kind of haloing kind of weird stuff going on. Now with the Sony cameras, this particular Sony camera, it's fantastic. Now I'm not going to run through all the different sharpness. I got a better examples so I'm going to show you here in a second when we kind of look at my some of the demo footage that I've got. But now if you're shooting in the full frame mode, you will get aliasing amore. Um, when you're in the crop mode, you're going to get some aliasing more, but it's very, very slight. I mean, it's really hard to find, which is great because that's where this camera shines. It's where you've got the full pixel readout when you're in the crop mode. Now, my recommendations are pretty much to keep this thing at zero. It does a fantastic job so that you can skip that step in post-processing that I couldn't step before when I had the Canon cameras. I'd always have to apply about 20 to 35 on the slider for Premiere Pro and then that would bring up the sharpness from it all the way down in the camera to an acceptable level on the Canon camera. So you don't have to do that. You can pretty much skip the whole process, which I'll demonstrate here later. But one of the great things about keeping it at its default zero setting is your focus peaking works better. Now, if you were to turn all the sharpness all the way down, there's less for that focus peaking to grab onto and to show you what's actually in focus. So it's it's a fantastic that we can just leave it at its default setting. Now, if you're doing a landscape, I've done many landscapes where I've gone to plus one, plus two, no halos. It looks fantastic. So let's go into um, and take a look at some of the footage and I'll show you some demos. I don't have perfect skin. If I were to hire a model that has perfect skin, it wouldn't be fair because you won't see some of these sunspots and stuff like that out of my skin. Because as you over sharpen, a lot of that detail in your skin is going to come out and it might not be the most flattering. So if you're shooting at a CEO, maybe the same age as I am, um, this it might be helpful to you. So what I'm going to do is we're going to punch in and punch out of the 4K image. And just to let you know, when um, at least in Premiere Pro, there's two options. There's set to frame size. This is the good one. Scale to frame size. Think of this as the bad one because... If you choose this, um, you can actually be throwing resolution away. So set to frame size, what, the ha what happens here is when I do this, um, when I bring it in the timeline, you'll notice that the scale is set to 50%. So we're not looking at one to one uh, or 100% of the 4K image. If I was, for instance, if I type in 100, that is looking at, I guess, one to one on your 4K image. So we're going to be punching in and out here as we go through. So this is a negative three. Negative three right here punched in. Negative two. Negative one. And this is zero. So we're going to stop right here. Again, you're going to notice like the sunspots in my skin. <laughs> this is kind of odd talking about myself. But um, how much sharpness I've got in the eyes. And again, we're punched in here. So um, to me personally, I would like a little bit more sharpness going on around the eyes. Uh, and it looks like we can go a little bit more because we're not seeing a whole bunch of nasty stuff appear like on the Canon cameras. Uh, the sharp sharpness here, especially in this area right here, 
would really get kind of nasty um, with the sunspot. So let's go to plus one, plus two, and I think right about here, plus two actually looks pretty good. So if you're planning to do a lot of punch in and punch out, maybe you up the sharpness a little bit in camera if you want to actually do it that way and you want to skip the step in post. If you want more flexibility, probably the best thing to do is actually shoot at the default zero and add sharpness later. So here's plus three, and I think plus three is a little bit too crispy. Um, you can see what's happening here around my eyes, these reflections in my eyes from the soft boxes. It's getting just a little bit too sharp for my taste. And then if we uh, zoom back out, here's plus three again, zoomed out. It's just a little bit too sharp for my, because a lot of times what you'll be doing is you'll be, um, you'll zoom out and then you'll punch in on the interview. So you want to sometimes actually set the sharpness difference between those two when you punch in and punch out. And just for kicks, here is a minus three, so you can see how far we've come in terms of sharpness. All right, next up we're going to talk about moray patterns, basically. We're going to also go compare crop versus full frame and sort of the aliasing of moray that patterns that you might encounter. Right now this is a 4K image shot in the crop mode, and I have set this to a scale of 50. And we're going to punch in on this image so we can actually see this better. And I changed my shirt. Hey, let me pause right here. This is a negative three sharpness. And this particular shirt will create moray patterns quite quickly because of very fine detail. These lines that are on the shirt will create moray patterns. And sure, sure enough, we can see this on the full frame side. I see moray patterns here, but I don't see it over on this side. The left hand side is APS-C, Super 35, crop mode, and the right side is using a full frame. And I use the same exact lens, I just try to move in closer and far away to get these two to match. So let's go ahead and step through here. This is a negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, plus one, plus two, and plus three. And as you'll have noticed, right here on that collar, uh, now, if you're watching this on a smaller monitor, or let's say an iPhone, an iPad, or something that's maybe not showing a true 1080 resolution that I'm publishing this to, you actually might see aliasing on the APS-C. But I, I can tell you, watching this one-to-one -one at 1080, this there's no aliasing going on here. There is on the full frame. So that's one of the reasons why you want to shoot with this camera in video mode if you have sensitive subjects or fine detail, you want to shoot in the APS-C mode. Let me explain what we have here. So on the left hand side, um, I've shot this at zero sharpness, so at the default level. And here I brought the sharpness all the way down to negative three on the right hand side. But in post, I've brought up the sharpness to match. Now we're going to run through this. I'm going to also do this exercise in full frame mode, but the first one I want to show you is in the APS-C mode. Now what I want you to look for is the collar, and you'll notice that the, both collars look pretty much the same. There's no aliasing or more. They both match really well. Now we're going to do the same thing again. Uh, the zero on the left, minus three on the right. This is full frame, right side sharpened to match. Now watch how much aliasing we get on both. So what I'm trying to prove here is that bringing the sharpness down in camera and then bringing it up in post to match does gives you no benefit because they're both have the exact same amount of aliasing in the frame. So that's what I'm trying to prove here. Now let's go back and we're going to rewatch part of this again. Now what I want you to do right here is this part of my skin. See this side where I'm moving my mouse around? You disregard the, that side. We're just going to concentrate on this one and I'm going to compare this to the full frame. So right now we're APS-C mode and as I play it, watch right in here. And as you can see, it looks very clean, no artifacts, looks good. Now let's do the same thing, watch here, but this is full frame. And if you'll notice, if you can see what I'm seeing on my monitor, there's actually some like aliasing or some sort of artifacting happening actually within the detail on my face. And that's yet again why you'd want to shoot in the APS-C mode rather than the full frame mode because you can get some of those weird artifacts happening, especially when you punch in like we are with on this 4K image. All right, the last thing I want to show you in terms of sharpness is a kind of a typical landscape. I am actually have shot these before with Canon cameras and I've gotten halos around them. Um, this is at uh, 4K image, APS-C, 
uh, I've brought it down to 1080, so it's been reduced by 50%, but we're gonna go ahead and zoom, and we're gonna go zoom way in <laughs> here in a minute. So here's 100% at minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two, plus three, as you can see at three, it is getting a bit sharp. That's To me, that's too much. And just for kicks, back down to zero, and there is a negative three. So what I want to do next is we're gonna zoom way, way, way in. So on the left-hand side, we've got the default sharpness of zero, and on the right-hand side, we have a negative three. And as you can see, there's quite a big difference uh, between the two. So next up, we're gonna do is uh, zero on the left again, minus three on the right again, but this one is sharpened to match. And go ahead and watch. And to me, the zoomed in to 200% on this 4K image, um, I gotta tell you, I almost think I like the sharpening done in camera than Adobe does on the right hand side. Maybe like right around here where these objects are, I think these maybe have a little bit more detail perhaps. These kind of have a different look to them. So sharpening in post, um, you know, from a negative three, maybe is not the best thing to do with these cameras. All right, now that we've covered contrast, saturation, and sharpness, for all these tests I'm about to show you on the creative styles, we're gonna step through all those now. I've got the contrast turned on negative three, the saturation is at the default zero, and the sharpness at the default zero. And all of the ones that I'm gonna show you are set exactly the same way. So right now we're on the standard creative style. Now what I'm going to, maybe as we go along, I'll point out different things. I'm going to show a lot more examples in a lot different environments than just my office um, later. But I want to step through them all because you're going to notice quite a bit of difference. This is actually kind of an interesting scene because we've got I've got my blinds open. You're going to see a lot of things happen with the highlights. You're going to see a lot of things happen with the shadows. And you're also going to start noticing things with the colors as well. Vivid, and you should notice that uh, my skin got more saturated. These got more, and you're gonna notice the contrast levels have changed as well. And each one of these creative styles has, um, like I, I'm not changing the contrast. They're all at a negative three, and they all have their own built-in kind of contrast. And I'm gonna show you later which ones have the most contrast and which ones have the least. All right, this is the neutral creative style. This one's pretty similar to standard. In terms of the contrast levels, they're a little bit different but this is neutral. All right, this is clear. Again, I haven't changed any contrast setting. Still at negative three, but you'll notice, whoa, the contrast changed a lot. A lot of stuff on the windows blown out, the darks are, and I'm kind of almost kind of a desaturated level on my skin. And actually like the, uh, the mid-tones where my skin is, it seems to have dropped in level a bit, whereas the brights have gotten even brighter. It's a very contrasty, almost desaturated image a little bit. It has kind of a, an odd look to it and there's I use a lot of the different creative styles and I'll explain when I do it but this is one of them that I don't use that often at all all right this one is deep um, some weird stuff going on with the contrast curve on this one especially around my skin tones um, I don't really like what it's doing right here in this particular lighting set setup so this one is deep light and it kind of does what it says it kind of lightens everything up you'll notice quite a big difference between deep and then light it's taken those mid-tones where my skin is and it's brought it up in level. All right, this is portrait. You're gonna notice that there's not much difference between portrait, standard, and neutral. They're all very close, they're all very similar. Um, and those are the three that I use the most. Now portrait has the least amount of contrast. So you're gonna be able to see into the, the, the highlights better and you're also gonna be able to see into the shadows um, better. This is the least contrasty of all the creative styles. Now, sometimes I don't like what it does with the skin tones and it should actually make the skin look a little bit better. It depends on the lighting situation. A lot of times I'll bounce between neutral, standard, and portrait to find where the best skin tones are for that particular person. All right, this landscape, and as you can see, it's a big departure from portrait, isn't it? There's a lot more contrast going on. There's a lot more con or saturation going on in the colors, as you can see right here. And I'm going to show you some examples of actual some real landscapes. And I do landscape, uh, I use it on occasion, especially if it's a kind of an overcast day and I need the more contrast and I need more saturation, um, I'll definitely switch over to the landscape. All right, this one is sunset. This one is night. All right, this one is autumn. 
or I believe it's actually called Autumn Leaves. All right, this one's black and white, and as you can see, it's very contrasty. All right, this one is sepia. All right, let's step through some creative styles and maybe show what some are good for. Right here, I've got some autumn leaves, and I'm in the autumn leaves preset, and it looks pretty good. It's very saturated. You got some deep, dark blue sky. You got a lot of different colors going on here. You got greens and yellows and reds all within this tree, which is how oh, I found this tree. I was like, oh, I got to shoot this for autumn leaves and do an example. So let's go ahead and run through them. So this is autumn leaves, night, sunset. Here's landscape, which looks pretty good too. Portrait, doesn't look very good. Uh, light, deep, clear, neutral, vivid, and standard. So let's go ahead and stop on standard. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, you could shoot it in standard and then just increase the contrast and saturation and you get something that's very similar to autumn. So let's go ahead and give that a try. Now what I want you to pay attention to here is the vector scope. Let's go back here and you see this line that goes around here with I'm using my mouse and between red and yellow you can see especially in this tree between red and yellow we can see that we're outside that line on the vector scope that's showing saturation. So it's showing there's a lot of things saturated between red and yellow, and it's going beyond this line, which from what I understand, and I'm not a broadcast guy, but this is not legal, meaning if you sent this to broadcast, they'd probably send it back to you saying it's illegal and you have to redo it. So I could back this down ever so slightly because there's not much past that line. But what I want to show you is watch this. I'm going to try to match this in terms of saturation first with standard, and I'm going to increase the contrast first because that's usually what I do. I know I'm going to go to about a 35 or so. I've done this before. And you can see all of a sudden uh, we've got a lot more um, colors and the contrast looks a lot better. But you'll notice that on the vector scope, now we're way outside the legal limit of that line. Where, the, where this one might have passed, this one's definitely not going to pass. And what you'll notice too, as I go back and forth between the two, I'm going to say that autumn is still more sat looks to me more visually saturated than standard does, even though on the vector scope that's not the way it appears. But I would almost want to add more. You see, I don't see the greens and the yellows as much as I do here. So if I were to even pump up the, uh, I don't know, let's go to about 115 on the saturation slider. And now the difference between these two is they're, they're a little bit different, but they're very um, similar to me by eye, what saturation looks like. But when you look at the vector scopes, like, wow, how am I going to rein this in? So it's legal in this for those guys that are worried about broadcast. So in this case, again, if you're not a professional colorist like myself and you're wanting to stay within the legal limit, you might shoot with like the autumn leaves because then you wouldn't have to deal with this issue later trying to clamp down on all this excess um, saturation that's showing up on the vector scope. All right, next we're going to step through uh, this this scene right here, this is a standard. We got vivid, neutral, clear, deep, light, which is probably my favorite here, portrait, landscape, sunset, night, autumn, and black and white. So if we go back to light, I think in this instance where you have a lot of clouds in the sky, for some reason light has, and especially in the contrast curve, uh, up in the um, highlights, up in the clouds, seems to work really well in terms of definition. If you look at something like, compare it to like portrait, I just like the way the clouds are a little bit more defined especially like down in here where you can see more, I guess, contrast in the highlights basically uh, versus something like portrait. So that's one of the rare instances when I use light, especially when I have a, a big sky with a lot of clouds. Sometimes that works really well for me. All right, we've got a landscape scene and this is standard, vivid, neutral, clear, Deep, light, portrait, and of course landscape, which is what we're actually shooting. 
sunset, night, and autumn. So let's go back to uh, landscape. Landscape and vivid are pretty similar in terms of their contrast and saturation. If you're going, again, this all comes down to time. If you have no time in post and you want to get it right in camera and that's the look you're going for, then I, again, I would switch around uh, to the different creative styles and pick something like vivid or landscape. Me personally, I think landscape works pretty well here. Let's move on. So, so far we've been showing you stuff that's been inside, uh, uh, sorry, outside. Now we're going to go inside and take a look at some, this is actually some stage lighting, which I'm pretty sure is uh, tungsten. About 3200 Kelvin is what I was shooting at when I shot this. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at a uh, stage scenario. Here's standard. This is normal tungsten lighting. And then we'll go to vivid. Next up, we've got neutral. Neutral actually works pretty well here. Clear, which is very contrasty. And then we're going to deep. And next up, we'll go to light. And then next up, we'll go to portrait. And then we've got landscape, which looks way too saturated here and sunset. Next we got night and we've got autumn. So let's go ahead and stop on autumn. So here um, neutral for me is probably the best one because I know later on in post I'll be able to add a little bit of saturation and get this to look pretty good. Saturation and some contrast. Portrait, I was kind of surprised in this one. This to me, I don't like the way the skin looks here. See his arm right here? Looks very orangey. Compared to here, this looks a lot more natural. And I think once I add some saturation, those uh, skin tones will look just fine. Again, you know, we were just looking at a landscape, but now if we look at landscape here, uh, it just, just doesn't work. It's way too contrasty. The highlights, as you can see, are blown out. And as you can see, the skin is way too um, orangey and way too... Uh, maybe if I change the white balance ever so slightly, maybe cool it down a little bit, but uh, it's still way too saturated. All right, this next part I think you'll find pretty interesting is I'm going to compare S-Log to all the different creative styles. S-Log is our flattest um, profile, basically. Um, so what I've done here, you can see on this waveform monitor, is I've stretched the normally, uh, it comes around, I'd say 90 or so. Here, in fact, I'll... Let me turn this off for you. So normally S-Log looks like this. And what I'm doing is applying a curve adjustment. So I'm basically just stretching up the highlights and bringing down the shadows. So they'll match more of the linear creative styles because Log is logarithmic and it's a bit flatter. So it's kind of more of an apples to apples comparison. But what's interesting is you'll get to see how it compares to S-Log, all the creative styles. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So I'm gonna turn on portrait first. In portrait, as I step through these, these are going from the least contrasty to uh, the most contrasty creative style. So what you'll see here is on the S-Log where my mouse is, each individual step, this is their third of a step increments, are very even, especially in the mid-tones. And as you get down the shadows, they kind of bunch up a little bit. But what we see here over on portrait is there's a bit more space between uh, each third of a step increment, especially around here where the midtones where somebody's skin might be. So there's a bit more contrast going on here. So if we move on to a night, nighters are, I would say probably our second less contrasty creative style. And then we'll go to standard. And I'm gonna say standard and this one is neutral. I would say these two are almost dead even. Uh, there's standard and there's neutral. They're pretty much not much difference in terms of contrast. Next up is light, uh, more contrast, and deep, even more contrast, landscape. As you can see, it's really starting to stretch out down here. Um, there's more of a curve developing down in the shadows, so which is crushing more of the uh, shadow detail. Um, autumn, sunset, black and white, it's very contrasty, vivid even more contrasty. And the most contrasty of all of them is definitely clear. 
it's got some really funky stuff going on. You can see with this curve, it kind of just kind of goes for about 20. Once it gets about 20 IRE, it just gets really stretched out. You can see these big jumps going on here in the, uh, each one of these are a third of a stop and it gets really stretched out. So this is very contrasty. This over here, S log, not very contrasty. So basically what I'm trying to say here is if you're wanting to shoot in the least contrasty of all creative styles have the most options in post like you do with S-Log, Portrait is definitely one you want to use. Uh, the only thing the downside with Portrait is sometimes it doesn't treat the skin tones in terms of color that well. So for me, I usually stand stick with either standard or neutral because those have, to me, a little bit more accurate skin tones and color. All right, let's switch from talking about contrast to color. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to compare on the right hand side, I'm going to be swapping out this side with all the different creative styles. And I'm using neutral as my, uh, I guess you could call it my base, so you have something to compare it to as we go along. Let me show you what we're looking at. So I'm going to turn off the neutral side. And what we're looking at here, especially on this chart, there's six colors. And you see these boxes. Each one of these colors should be lined up pretty well. Uh, you can see blue's a bit off, magenta's a bit off, red looks pretty close. Remember, that these colors on here are sat desaturated by half. So if they were fully saturated, they'd be actually in each one of these boxes. And this line that comes out up over the legal limit, I believe, this is actually my orange shirt landing somewhere between red and yellow. Let's go ahead and turn back on our base. So our base is just gonna give us something to compare it to. And as we step through, each one of these are going to become less saturated. So let's go ahead and step through. So the next one is landscape. I'm going to go to vivid, sunset, portrait. And let me stop at portrait. Um, I like neutral better than portrait. Uh, portrait to me just has a little bit too much yellow in my skin. And it could be just the type of lighting I'm using. These are all uh, custom white balance, as you can see, we all have very neutral white, um, gray, and black. But uh, it might be just the lights that I'm using, because sometimes, in some instances, portrait looks the best. But here, to me, it just it just has a little bit too much yellow in my skin. So let's move on. Next one is light, and the next one is standard. Now standard. Um, I actually say standard looks the best in terms of skin tones, at least in this particular lighting situation. I like it better than neutral. Let's continue. So we got night. Next up is deep. And we got clear, which is very desaturated. And black and white, which of course is the, <laughs> doesn't have any color. So actually if we were to turn off our reference, you'll see this dot in the middle go just to a dot because there's no no color information here to actually be represented on the vector scope. All right, next up, what I'm going to do is let's go ahead and turn back on the other layer. And this time what I've done is I've matched saturation levels. So I basically took the most saturated item, which is the shirt. And as you can see, that little dot there, um, you can see the colors are a little bit different. Uh, the colors have shifted on one versus the other. You're going to see two sets of dots. You can see that they're not all perfectly aligned. They're somewhere a little bit different. And each creative style has a little bit of different, I guess you could call it color science to it. So as we step through this time, we've matched the saturation. So you don't have to look at the saturation levels. But what I would suggest you look at is just the skin tones um, so you can compare. And maybe there's one that you like more than another. So here's autumn, then we've got a landscape, vivid, sunset, portrait. And you can see this one is very uh, uncontrasted. You can see the black levels. Light, standard, night, deep, clear, and black and white. 
So going back to um, the ones that I use the most, neutral and portrait. Um, I'd almost say I like neutral better in this lighting situation. And then um, in terms of standard, this one right here, this is probably my favorite in terms of this lighting situation. And again, if you're maybe in sunlight or you have maybe LEDs instead of fluorescent lights, or maybe you have tungsten lighting that's at 3200, this could all change. But it's just for this particular instance with these particular fluorescent lights, I think standard works the best. Flipping around all the different creative styles to find out which one works best in a certain scenario can be time consuming. And sometimes you just want to be able to grab it, go, and find the best one. So the but the biggest recommendation I can do is remember in the um, when you're setting up the creative styles at the very bottom there was numbered ones there's one two three four five six seven or something like that. Well, if you bounce around like I do between standard, neutral, and portrait most of the time, assign those to one, two, and three, so they're right next to each other. So as you scroll through them, you'll be able to see the difference, and it'll become quite obvious as you bounce between one and the other. Like, oh, that one's better for this particular scene and then you can grab hold of it, which is fantastic. Now, this next section that's coming up is the picture profile, the S-Log section. So if you're a brand new beginner to this camera, I'd say go ahead and skip it and go on to the next chapter. Um, come back in like six months from now when you had a better uh, understanding of the camera, you've used it, you've post-processed your images a lot more with these creative styles that we have, and then you're ready to take the next step to get the most uh, dynamic range out of the sensor with S-Log. All right, time to get into S-Log. This will be interesting. Actually, I recorded this whole section yesterday on S-Log and I was editing it. I was like, you know, it was just me jabbering on. I was like, you know, you guys or gals are not gonna get much out of it. Just listen to me talk. I think if you watch me work, um, process this particular image that you see right here in S-Log, um, you'll learn, learn a lot more because I'm gonna stumble. I am not a professional colorist. You've heard me say that before, but the professional colorist um, tutorials that I've watched, they're very slick, they're very um, pre-planned. You know, they know in advance what they're gonna do, so it looks perfect. Um, I, on the other hand, you're gonna have to actually stumble and try different things, and it's not gonna work perfectly the first time, which I think will help you guys out a lot watching me make mistakes. All right, so really quick, again, this is S-Log. S-Log is uh, ISO 800. That's our minimum ISO we can go, and I'm shooting at 800 right now. Um, this 18% gray, gray pat shoot pat right here. On my Shogun, I've already gotten this to be uh, on the waveform monitor at 50 IRE. So right after I'm done recording this really quickly, because the clouds are coming in, I want to make sure I got the same exact light. I'm going to record this also in the standard creative style. But first, before we do, I wanna rotate this around because I'm gonna use this as a tool as well. I'm gonna make sure that black is not reflective. And I'll look into the camera. All right, we're gonna do this in DaVinci Resolve free version. I've tried doing this in Speedgrade and Premiere Pro and it's really hard to do. So this is after I've done all the grading. And so what we're gonna do, this one right here is and let me show you the before. This is the standard creative style with the contrast turned all the way down. And here's after. All I did here was just recovered some of the highlights, correct some of the colors, and that's pretty much it. And then if we go to S-Log, here's the before, and here is the after. So we've got a lot of work to do. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and, let's go ahead and go here, and I'm gonna erase all these three nodes, basically. So we go here and delete them. Create a new node. All right, the first thing we're gonna do is recover the highlights the best we can. Uh, you could do it a bunch of different ways. Um, you could bring highlights down this way, and as you can see, even with S-Log, we've lost some detail in that sky right there. It's just totally gone. Um, because we made a compromise, we said we wanted this neutral gray to be at 50%, so that dictated everything. So there's even with S-Log, you're definitely gonna blow out some highlights in extreme situations like this. And this is pretty extreme, even though this window right here is t um, tinted. So the object here is to get it to look like this, except maybe recover some of the highlights. So this is a great exercise to do. So the first thing we're gonna do is kind of normalize the signal in terms of the highlights and the shadows. You can see it's not resting at zero, so I'm gonna just gonna bring this down a little bit. Now we could try bringing this down here, 
But what happens is, see this line right here? This is the white patch right here. And that represents, um, from DSC Labs, they kind of recommend that you put that around 90 IRE. This patch should be reflecting about 90% of the light. So um, it should be up here where my mouse is. So we've got a long way to go. But we don't want to blow out the highlights any more than we have to, because as you can see, we've re recovered quite a bit. But as we bring this lit up, we're gonna crunch this. So something's gonna have to give a little bit. So let's go ahead and instead of doing it on this curves adjustment, I'm gonna bring this down a couple of clicks. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my dropper tool, I'm gonna to click on the whites. So you just saw a white point right there. The mids right there and the blacks right down there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to bring this up. And what this is going to do is going to create contrast. And what I'm looking for is this line to be a little bit above this 896. Again, this is probably 10 bit, but if it was 90, it would be like a 900 right here. So we just bring it up to about right here, let's say. And that should match what we have here on the standard uh, profile. So we have a little bit more to go. So we're going to have to bring this up a little bit more. Let's bring it up a little bit. And then in terms of the mids, it's really hard to see in this big mess, jumbled mess of stuff. So I'll make it a little easier on you guys since you're new to this, or maybe some of you are new to it. I'm going to go to um, edit sizing and I'm going to do some blanking just so you can see things a lot easier. And if you don't know how to read scopes or you haven't been reading scopes for very long, uh, this definitely helps. Definitely helps me too because sometimes it's really hard to see what's going on. We can see um, this matches pretty well. And in fact, let's go ahead and we're going to have um, blanking to this one as well. Let's go ahead and go down here. This is the, again, the one we're on right now is the standard creative style. And as we can see, the whites are a little bit above this line. The um, gray is a little bit above 512. And then uh, the blacks are kind of in between these two lines. So let's go back. So this is, we, this looks good. This needs to come up slightly. So I'm gonna go back to our curves adjustment and we're gonna just, uh, maybe I have to go up just a little bit right here. And this is kind of a mess down here because um, the black isn't quite black and we're gonna have to white balance. And you can see there's, there's some stuff going on here. The whites look pure white. The grays could be a little bit adjusted and then blacks are kind of all over the place. And so the whites look pretty good. This, I'm just gonna try, see what we can do. And what I'm gonna do here, is instead of being primary, it's gonna go into log. Log, from my understand, you can make very minor adjustments here and it won't affect the highlights and the shadows as much as the primaries because the primaries are all over the place. Again, this is not really a color grading course. And so what I do here is just kind of move it around until all those three colors come together. And sometimes it's, uh, especially it's really difficult on the on the blacks. In fact, I pretty much know I'll probably have to redo this again later, but that's a lot closer uh, than we had it before. Let me try one more time. Yeah, maybe, maybe about right there. All right, so now what we've got right here is we've got kind of a curve and what S log is is basically a gamma curve and we're kind of re we're not applying any LUTs here we're gonna work on LUTs later but I wanted to do this all by hand first to kind of demonstrate a few things um, so basically what we've done here is we've increased we see this nice curve right here in the highlights um, the midtones haven't changed too much and the blacks haven't changed too much at least not yet so the least the way I exposed it and again I exposed uh, middle gray right at 50 pretty much 50%. All right, if we look at the difference again between the two, we're going to notice we've got some good things going on here in terms of this, the midtones and the uh, lows, but we've got some major differences in color. Um, we've pretty much white balanced everything, but we've got a saturation issue. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to switch over to uh, the vector scope. And as you can see right here, I've uh, multiplied times to the amount of color going on. So remember these these charts right here are half saturation. So basically I'm doubling it. So if I take this off, this is the actual signal and I'm doubling it so I can see what's going on. Now we're in the standard creative style and what, what's great about this, it's called the one shot from DSC Labs. 
all these colors are perfectly put into their boxes. And this is this line right here is your skin tone line. And as you can see, we have different skin tones and they're pretty much on the line. They're a little bit more towards the red, but from right now, we're going to just deal with these, these colors right here. This is standard. Remember now I'm going to go back to S log. So you can see right off the bat, if you know how to read a vector scope, uh, this represents saturation. So uh, what we need to do is get these into their boxes. At this point, you know what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to create a new node, bring it down here. This will be our kind of our color saturation node. And you can actually label these. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to take the, um, in the second node, I'm going to increase the saturation. And what I do is go a little bit past on the red and I'm getting the magenta and the blues. I'm going to try to find a spot where they're mo all mostly in their boxes. And as you can see, they're, they're a little bit off. So what we're going to do first is we're going to go to, um, we're going to go to U versus saturation. Again, we've gone really technical here on this course. This is not a beginner level course anymore. Uh, I'm going to take the reds and I'm going to bring the saturation down. Um, let's see, yellow is pretty good. Green, bring that right about there. Cyan needs to come up a little bit. You can see what I'm doing here is I'm just adjusting the saturation level for each color. Now there's other ways to do this, especially when you get into creating LUTs, which we're going to talk about more a lot later. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to hue versus hue. Again, I don't, you know, this is only like a five, six hour course. I don't really have time to uh, explain all the different things that I'm doing here. But what I'm going to try to do is get these perfectly in the boxes. You can see blue is a bit off. Uh, and you'd be surprised, these little minor changes that I'm doing really affect the overall um, image when you're done with it. It's pretty amazing. Uh, put the yellow right there. The, the two that you want to pay the most attention to are yellow and red when you have somebody's face in the frame. These are crucial, getting these right in the boxes. Magenta, blue, let's see, blue's a little bit off. Put that right there. And that looks pretty good. Again, I want to reiterate what we're on a two time zoom. This is what it normally looks like, but I'm just zooming in on the vector scope. In terms of S log, one of the things you're going to run into if you're brand new, like I was many, many months ago when I first started this, you're going to look at the image, you're going to say, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> and that's what's great about this chart. This chart's going to give you uh, ideas to get your contrast right and get your colors right. And then it'll guide you into a certain situation where you have a very correct image. And that's what we're going for here, where I'm not doing any sort of fancy color grading. I'm just doing color correction, basically, and trying to match S-Log up with the creative style. Let's go ahead and get out of here. We're going to go to our um, blanking. I'm going to reset the blanking. And let's go back to the other one and reset its blanking. Here is our S-Log. And here is our um, standard profile. Now, if we look at the colors here, we can see my blue shirt is kind of leaving that bounding box. But again, we shouldn't really be looking at this. We should be looking at this. We're actually legal right here. Even this little yellow that you see over here on my uh, sweatshirt, that's starting to approach yellow, but we're all legal right here. This is all really good. Now, if we go here, you can see there's subtle differences in the vector scope in terms of color, but in terms of overall saturation, I'd say we're pretty much there. It looks really, really good uh, as we go back forth, not only on the vector scope, if you're watching, putting your eyes here, but if you put your eyes here as I go back and forth too, it's all looking very good. And another thing to look for here too is what we've done in terms of the highlights. Um, you can see there's more blown out highlights here versus S-Log, which is right here. Now, we did end up destroying more highlights. Let me bring back the waveform monitor. Since this, this window right here is right here and I had to get this line up to the 90, about 90 IRE, I had to crunch all this information in the window up higher because of that. Now, if I had more time, I would create a window or a mask basically around here, and I would have brought the window down separately so I'd have more, more I could recover more information. But as you can see, I have recovered a bit more information than the creative style. And if you look at the blacks, the black levels are pretty close, but 
not quite perfect. And that's something we're gonna work on next. Like you can see in the, the black level, especially in the closet, they're a little bit different. So let's work on that next. So I'm gonna bring the blacks down by taking the this curve right here. You remember we're on a new node. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually lock off all of these with the eyedropper tool. See, I've locked off all these. And I'm just gonna take this and I'm just gonna maybe crunch this down. I'm gonna play around with this slider a little bit and that's not really doing much for me. So I'm gonna put another lock right here. I didn't mean to move that. And I'm gonna bring this down just a little bit. So now if we go back and forth, they're looking pretty close. But now we're missing one, let's see, let me work on the blacks just a little bit more. All right, as so we're going back and forth between the two, they look pretty close, but the one thing I'm missing on S-Log right here is the mid-tone contrast. Um, so what I'm gonna do again, uh, I'm gonna use blanking. So I'm gonna make sure we're on S-Log. And I'm going to blank off, not the chart this time, but just my face. Because that's where I'm noticing that I just don't have enough mid-tone contrast. And that's kind of where my skin is. Kind of in those mid-tones or upper mid-tones. And I'm going to do the same thing with this one. The standard creative style. Now when we go back and forth between the two, you can see that they're pretty close. In fact, they're really close. But the only thing different I can see is maybe the standard is a little bit, um, the signal's pulled down to the bottom a little bit more. Yeah, it definitely is. So what I'm gonna do is go back to my curves adjustment. I'm on a brand new node. I'm gonna pick a point in my skin right here that's dark and pick a spot in my skin that's bright. So I've got two of these white dots. And basically, I'm going to increase the contrast by bringing this up and bringing this down. You see how I'm pulling that signal downward when I do this right here? Now, if we compare here and here, uh, let's see. I need to actually bring this down. Maybe right there. So that should have added some contrast. All right, well, let's go back to and clear the, the blanking on both of these. And now you'll notice that they look very close. But the only thing different, you can see there's some reflection issues going on here. I don't know what that is. But in the closet, if you look at the shadows, in fact, let's go ahead and zoom in. Let's take a look at the shadows in the closet. Now one is a bit warmer than the other. You see right here on S-Log, it's just a bit warm. There's a couple of different ways I could handle this. One of them is to just take out saturation in the, um, <laughs> in the darks. That's kind of cheating, so I'm not gonna do that. So actually what I'm gonna do is, let's go ahead, and I'm gonna create another node. And this one is just gonna deal with the shadows. Right, so right, let's zoom in on the shadows here. And I know it looks a little bit warm, so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to click on this chart right here. And I can see it looks pretty even here. So those colors look good. But I'm gonna like this printer in the background. All right, I know this printer has some red in it, so I'm gonna just pick um, right about here. And you can see that the the this is elevated. So I'm going to go ahead and lock off this part right here. Just go to the red channel and I'm going to just bring the red channel down slightly, maybe about right here. And now let's go and take a look at the difference between the two. And sure enough, it looks pretty similar. Maybe now we got too much green in it. So I'm going to take the green 
and pull that down a little bit as well. Really subtle changes, but now they're looking pretty close. The only thing I will say is maybe that the S log has a little more information in the shadows, which is okay. Um, we don't want to crush everything. So basically, we've gone from here to here. And this matches this. S-Log and the creative style. Like I said before, when you're brand new to S-Log and you're trying to grade it all yourself like I just did, it can be very difficult. Having this chart can really help you guide your way in terms of contrast, in terms of white balance, and also in terms of color and saturation to really get things to uh, match up uh, well together. All right, as you can tell, that took a long time to do. Now imagine you're doing a wedding and it's your very first wedding. The first thing you're not gonna be able to do is bring a chart like this and hold it up to the bride's face in every different lighting situation. Uh, if you're doing running gun shooting, that's just not gonna happen. Now, if you're gonna need a fast turnaround time, perhaps a corporate video needs to be done, the agency wants it done in a couple of days, well, you probably shouldn't be shooting an S-Log. You should probably be shooting and more of a standard creative style because getting this to look good doesn't take much time at all. I know a few colorists and I've talked to them in person and every time I talk about you know using S-Log in an 8-bit camera like this they all kind of shake their head and they're like Dave you just shouldn't do it. Now what I want to say here is those guys usually stretch the image quite a bit and what I've done here is I basically have done color correction not color grading. I haven't applied a look to this I haven't applied any sort of like green texture or anything like that. Uh, it's just a very clean, accurate image. In terms of using S-Log in a situation like this to retain a little bit more of the highlights, I think, you know, you could definitely use it as long as you don't push it too hard and as long as you expose for it correctly. I think this is a great exercise for you guys to do, especially if you're new to S-Log and you want to get up to speed quickly. Go ahead and go out and shoot two different things like we've done here and try to match them. You will learn a ton as you do this process and do it over and over again in different lighting situations and you'll learn just a ton about what's going on. Let me show you another example of S-Log and the power of S-Log. Here's my daughter's shoulder. Um, on the right hand side is S-Log color corrected and on the left hand side is standard uh, creative style. And as you can see, there's a massive difference um, in terms of the skin not being blown out on S-Log. You can see all the different pores and a lot more texture, whereas the standard profile is totally burnt out. Now, going back to this example here, uh, you can see that we didn't gain that much in terms of the amount of information in my neighbor's house. We gained some, but not a ton. And it's, it's all about how you expose for it. And I wanted to do this example so I wasn't really necessarily protecting the highlights. I was more after what was going on here in the skin. I wanted to be, have this be more accurate and not be muddy or noisy or anything like that. All right, now we're gonna talk about exposing for S-Log. And as you can see, this middle gray, and if we look over here on my Shogun with the waveform monitor up, I'm pretty close to about 32 IRE. Looks kind of dark, doesn't it? And I wouldn't, ex this way actually but this is the way Sony recommends in their white papers for some of their very high-end cameras they're really expensive cameras that are 10-bit now this is not 10-bit this is an 8-bit camera so what I'm gonna do is we're gonna run through um, three different levels I'm gonna do this which is very dark we're gonna do it at 50 percent for um, right in the middle so IRE 50 for middle gray and then I'm just gonna shoot to the right meaning I'm going to be overexposing it and trying to fit as much in there as I can. All right, now this should look a bit brighter. And again, I haven't added any contrast. There's no grading going on to this. So you're looking at just the raw S-Log footage, ungraded. 50% gray. If you look on the uh, Shogun monitor with the waveform up, you'll see that this line right here is at 50%. All right, now we're exposing to the right. Uh, if you look at the light meter, it's flashing too. So the light meter doesn't do you any good at this point um, <laughs> when you steer exposing to the right. But now you'll see that I've uh, switched things out and I'm now using the RGB parade because I want to see which individual color is actually clipping. 
And if you look at the middle gray over on that left side, kind of where my finger is going back and forth, that is uh, above 60. I would say, that, what is it, 62? So we went from 32, went to 50, and now we're at like 62 on middle gray. And you can see kind of where my hand is. Behind my hand is the blinds. And those blinds are being lit up by the sun. And you can see, not that I really care too much about, especially the, the slots in between them, um, but that red channel is kind of getting above 100 IRE. But it's not going too far above it, and I know we can recover those highlights because we have it's going into the super whites, and I can bring those down later. All right, so when you're overexposing like this, the light meter doesn't work. The histogram doesn't really work either because I was just looking at the histogram, and it's not even bunched up on the right-hand side of the screen, although I could see that my red channel is above 100, so that's not very accurate. Um, I have looked at the zebras and the zebras were accurate. They showed exactly where what was clipping in terms of the blinds. Now, when it comes to histogram, don't think of the histogram as being useless when you're overexposing. One of the things I look for in the histogram, I usually glance at it, is how much of the histogram am I filling? I think of the histogram as a bucket of data. The more I can fill that bucket, the better. Again, I don't want to go too far to the right because I don't know exactly what's clipping, but I want to fill it. So if, I, if we look back at what 32 IRE looked like, you'll notice that it was pretty much stacked to the left. So I'm not filling that codec or that file with enough data. Basically, I'm depriving it. I'm, it's gonna suffer later when I try to take that uh, signal and expand it out. When I do, when I add contrast and I stretch it out, two things are gonna happen. It's gonna get noisy, and also I'm gonna get banding because this is an 8-bit camera and it's gonna break apart faster. All right, next let's talk about dynamic range or latitude. There's a little bit of conflict going on, which I'm gonna describe here in a second, but I just wanna say that dynamic range is really hard to measure. You need really expensive charts, and even if you have the charts, do you can you interpret them correctly? So when you'll hear about cameras being having like 14 stops of dynamic range, that's the number we're referring to. Now when you expose this camera, how you expose this camera, what happens to the dynamic range? Now there's a bit of a conflict here. Let me read to you what comes with the, the actual Sony A7R 2 manual. When using S-Log2 gamma, the noise becomes more noticeable compared to other gammas. If the noise still is significant, even after processing pictures, I think they mean video, it may be improved by shooting with a brighter setting. However, that dynamic range becomes narrower according to when you shoot with a brighter setting. So, basically what Sony's saying here is if you're getting noise, shoot at a brighter setting, but they're saying that might come at a cost of dynamic range. All right, the conflict comes from Alistair Chapman. He's a certified Sony expert. Kind of contradicts what the uh, manual is saying in terms of dynamic range. Let me read you a couple sentences from his blog about S-Log, especially on the A7S camera, which he was actually referring to. Same range if you overexpose it. You are shifting the dynamic range. You will have more range in the shadows and less in the highlights, but it has so much range in the highlights, it's okay to make this shift. All right, I think I'm gonna to have to side with Alistair Chapman on this one. I've never seen any loss of dynamic range by shooting to the right. I, however, if you shoot like Sony recommends at IRE32, and most of it's stacked to the left, when you go and post-process that and you try to brighten the image up by pulling that signal up, Basically what's gonna happen is you're gonna get possibly banding because you're breaking apart the signal and because it's an 8-bit camera. And also you're gonna get noise because there's not much buckets of information down there. That's why we talked about the buckets of data. You wanna fill that histogram the best you can with an 8-bit camera like this, especially when you're shooting an S-Log. If I did have all these expensive charts and stuff like that to be able to accurately measure dynamic range, um, if you, you know, if these are your highlights and these are your shadows and middle gray, let's say this right here is right in the middle. Um, and if you shoot to the right, you're kind of shifting it. But if you're shooting right in the middle, what's going to happen is you're going to get more noise in the shadows. So those, those step charts that they have, basically what's going to happen is if you shoot in the middle gray, I'm just going to guess here because I've never done it with these expensive charts, but you'll see at least the chart that I have, it's very inexpensive. It's gonna get muddy and noisy down there. And sure, you can shoot the chart, 
but you're going to have to interpret the data. And if you have a lot of noise down there in the shadows between each individual step and you're trying to determine how many steps of latitude this camera has, if there's a lot of noise right there, it's going to get all muddy and it's going to be really hard to interpret that information on a very expensive chart. So that's why I kind of side with Alistair on this one. If you shift to the right, all that data, and you fill that histogram the best you can with this 8-bit camera, you're not going to have all that noise down there. And again, I've never really seen any sort of loss of dynamic range by shooting to the right. All right, let's compare these three shots, 32, 50, and 62. We're going to zoom in here in a second, but this is before I've done any sort of grading or anything like that. And now you'll see that I've graded all of them pretty equally. They all look pretty much the same. Now the proof is in the pudding when you zoom way in and here we go. 32 IRE you can see is very noisy, 50 gets cleaner. And then by the time you get to 62, you're looking at it in those shadow areas and it looks pretty darn clean. So the, the story here is S-Log2 really wants to be overexposed if you want to get a clean image. All right, don't make the same mistake I did. This is one of my very first shots with the A7R2 well, a long time ago. And as you can see, I was very underexposed in S-Log2. Here it is after I've graded it. I tried to do the best I could recovering it. But when somebody wears a black uniform like this, it makes it really difficult with S-Log. Because here it is zoomed in around 200%. And you can just see how noisy it is after I tried to bring those levels up. It just doesn't work out very well when you're shooting S-Log and you're not filling up that histogram. So don't make this mistake. Really want to do is fill your histogram when you are shooting at S-Log2. Here's an example of S-Log2 and I'm shooting to the right. So you, you can see it looks overexposed, but the time I go ahead and grade it, the blacks look great, everything looks fantastic. This is a great type of uh, environment to shoot S-Log in. Remember when I said you could actually expose and get cleaner results at a higher ISO than a lower one? Well, here's an example. So. This scene is actually way brighter than mine. It's really dark and only filled the histogram halfway full. Then in post later on, I uh, brought the levels up just so the image would look a little bit better. Again, this is ISO 1000. As you can see, that printer is getting pretty darn noisy uh, in the blacks. So what I did is instead of ISO 1000, I went all the way up to ISO 6400. I filled the histogram. Again, this is still Brother the Myers, but you can see in post, I brought the levels down. You see that curves adjustment? And it's way cleaner than IS-1000. Okay, here's another great example of when you want to expose um, at a higher ISO. Here's 1600, S-Log2. And then in post, I raised the, the levels to bring them up, make it, the shot look a little bit brighter. But here, ISO 12,800, I filled the histogram and that looks cleaner than at 1600 when I raise the levels. So again, here's 1600, here we're gone in closer. The levels are raised and then we're gonna switch over to 12,800 where I filled the histogram. This is all S-Log2 footage and as you can see, it's just a lot cleaner. All right, let's back out to this shot again. 12,800, S-Log2. I processed the image, try to make it look as best I can. Here compared to uh, standard, I, same ISO, and I brought the DRO level up to five. I think this image looks better. There's not a whole bunch of dynamic range in the shot, so sometimes it pays not to shoot in S-Log, but to shoot in something like a creative style of standard. Here's another example, ISO 3200. I'm filling the histogram pretty good on this one, but her shirt still looks pretty noisy. But when you compare it to ISO 1000 in the standard creative style, again, there's not much dynamic range in the shot, maybe that kind of edge light around the edge of her face, but that's about it. So sometimes you just don't want to shoot S-Log. In this case, this is done in S-Log and this works really well. Um, there's a lot of snow outside. It's kind of dark inside. There's a real high dynamic range scene. So this works extremely well. Now there's some places when it's so dark and you're trying to expose to the right, but you just can't because your ISO is just getting so high at that point and you look at your histogram and it's so stacked to the left side, it just, it's just not working. So in that case, again, it actually pays to go to something like a creative style of neutral. Same ISO and it just looks so much cleaner than trying to shoot an S-Log. All right, next up, we're gonna talk about LUTs. Uh, LUTs are lookup tables and sometimes you can apply them and they look fantastic and other times they, they don't look so good. Maybe you've watched somebody do a tutorial online where they plop the LUT on their S-Log2 footage and it magically looked 
perfect. Um, well, that is not the case normally. <laughs> I can tell you, it can be very frustrating. I mean, just look at the forums, all the questions people have about this particular topic. Now there's two types of LUTs. Uh, there's a technical camera LUT, which we're gonna be talking about. And then there's the film kind of emulation LUT made by like Film Convert or Impulse. We're not gonna be talking about those. Those are more creative. We're just trying to make it look right. And on top of that, you could add some sort of look after that. So let's go ahead and, and apply a LUT. Um, this is shot with S-Log2 and the S-Gamut. So if you've ever shot S-Log already, and maybe you went to PP7, I believe, on the camera, which is S-Log, it comes default with the S-Gamut, which we haven't talked about really yet. The S-Gamut color space is uh, Sony's top of the line ultra wide color space. It's supposed to record much deeper, richer colors in 709. I've run a lot of tests on this. Um, I haven't seen much difference at all. S gamut usually causes more problems than it's worth. That's really why I only use a uh, more linear color space like movie and not S gamut. We're going to demonstrate some of those here in a bit, but in terms of LUTs, um, let's go ahead and apply a LUT. So I'm going to go to the media tab, and if you watch Alexis Van Herkman's course like I have, he talks about adding the LUT in the proper workflow and go by the media tab and right clicking and going, see this where it says 1D LUT? There are, well, um, Blackmagic has provided us with this one that's called Sony S-Log2 Direct 709. If I choose it, you'll be like, whoa, wait a minute, Dave, you're overexposed, what happened? And well, remember what we talked about recording S-Log2 at IRE32, really dark? Well, I recorded this around 50. Maybe if I record it darker, you might not see this. But remember, if we record too dark, we get too much noise. So we're gonna we're just gonna leave it this way for right now. So if I bring down, let's maybe bring this over a little bit here so you can see what's going on. The waveform monitor. If I bring this down, levels down to where that white patch is around 90, you're gonna see, oh, that you know, the contrast looks way off, and it does. So this might actually not be the proper approach, but what I want to talk about here mostly is this S gamut. Um, and you'll notice that these are not lining up with the boxes at all. And if you'll notice, I am on 2x zoom. So if I actually increase the saturation, let's bring it up so you can see this better. The magenta, the green, the cyan channel are all like way, 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 way off. Um, you can see that in the colors here. So this particular, um, if we go back here, this particular LUT that comes standard with uh, Black Magic, this one is works well for when you record S-Log, but not in the S-Gamut color space. It does not correct any sort of S-Gamut color and convert it more into a linear color space. Let's actually go and get rid of this particular LUT, and I'm gonna reset this particular, what I did here. And let's go back. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to another LUT. There's 3D LUTs, I've, I've actually gone and found some other LUTs. There's one by Catalyst, and Catalyst is actually a program made by Sony. And they've got one called S-Log2 to S-Gamut. So I was thinking, well, if Sony created it, it must be correct. So if we're gonna apply this one, let's go back to the color tab and see what we got. I'm gonna to have to bring the levels down a little bit here. Um, and actually, as you can see, this one, which is very interesting, which Alexis Van Herkman said to do is put this in the proper location. Remember how we did it before, but you can see we're clipping right here. So something is definitely not working. Again, I am not a professional colorist, <laughs> as you said many, many times. If I actually go here, watch this, and I apply this LUT, Dave's LUT, and I apply this Catalyst S-Log2 to S-Gamut, and now I bring down the levels, Whoa, look at that. I don't have it truncated. So sometimes it really matters um, where you apply LUT. Some LUTs are different. Um, maybe it's because I brought this in from Sony's program. Maybe there's something odd going on. What I want to do is let's bring this up as high as I can to that white patch is around 90. So right about there. Let me bring it over so you can see. Now, you're gonna notice the colors on my face, the skin tones just don't look right at all. And in fact, if we look at, you know, I'm just gonna increase the saturation. This again is Sony's own LUT, and maybe it just doesn't work and resolve correctly or what, but I've actually even tried it in the Catalyst program and it doesn't work properly in there either. So right now, you know, we definitely have a problem. These aren't lining up at all. So again, I'm gonna go ahead and reset. We're gonna try another LUT. 
So we're going to go and now we're going to go to 3D LUT and Dave's LUT. And now there's this one called Oleg S-Log2 S-Gamut. Oleg is the first name of uh, Oleg Chernoff. Um, he's from Russia. He creates a really nice program called 3D LUT Creator. And as you can see, again, this didn't work correctly. So I'm actually going to take this off of here, say no LUT, and then we're going to go back to color, and then we're going to apply the LUT here. So we'll go to 3D LUT, Dave's LUT, Oleg, S-Log2, S-Gamut. And then I'll bring this down. And now as you can see, look what's happened here. These line up, let's increase the saturation. These line up a lot better. Uh, that's probably it was way too saturated, but as you can see, these are lining up a lot better. Not only that, but the contrast in my face looks really good too. Now, what is this LUT? This is Oleg uh, created a program called 3D LUT Creator. He took the values, mathematical values from Sony and plugged them into, uh, again, this is going to get way too complicated. I don't even want to open 3D LUT Creator and show you, but um, I can provide this LUT for you if you ever want to use it. I've got basically two LUTs. There's the, um, I call it Oleg, since he's the one that created it. Uh, there's one that's just S-Log2 only, meaning there's no S-Gamut involved. It's more of a linear color space. And then there's this one. So I hope this is not getting too complicated, but basically what I'm trying to prove the point here is applying a caramel LUT is not easy. And because you've tried and watched me do this several times, this is the closest one that looks correct. All I had to do is basically bring the levels down a little bit so they weren't clipping and uh, just change the saturation level and that looks pretty darn good and the colors are all lining up actually really well especially when you compare them to the other camera LUTs that are out there and I've tried this on a lot of different footage and this particular LUT looks really well so what I'm going to do is I'll put it on a Dropbox link down below these videos so if you want to use this one you definitely can and I think it'll help out a lot. All right, next up, I'm gonna apply one more LUT, and this is a S-Log2 shot with the still color profile, not s gamut. So basically what I need to do here is add contrast, the contrast curve for s gamut, but not really change the color at all. So I'm gonna right click and go down here to 3D LUT. I'm gonna pick Dave's LUTs, and this one I'm only gonna click is Oleg S-Log2 only, meaning it's just applying contrast and not like S gamut. It's only applying mostly no color differences, just uh, S log 2. So we're going to apply that. You can see it's a bit blown out. So I'm going to need to bring things down maybe to about right here. And then what I'm going to do is increase the saturation. And again, let's actually take this off of 2x. Increase this to saturation a bit. Maybe about right here. And then I'm actually going to bring, this was uh, a bit darker than to my eye so maybe a, this was the sun was just coming up so maybe things around right here maybe increase the saturation a little bit more so this is kind of like uh, before and after so in some instances yes you know LUTs do definitely work it's just a question of finding the right technical LUT to help you with that contrast because I'll tell you trying to do this by hand um, is not easy to do uh, with you know trying to create your curve here rather than applying a lot and then prime bringing the levels down and then uh, adjusting some saturation sometimes you can get there fairly quickly all right next up we're going to step through all the color modes within the picture profile area uh, on the left is going to be a reference on the right is the one we're going to change still I think is the most accurate so that's why we're going to use that as a reference these are both shot in S log 2 and as you can see, I just baited uh, some contrast and some other adjustments up here. I didn't change the colors at all. Uh, I'll basically just change the contrast to match them up so they all look very similar as we go through. And you can pay attention just to color. When you go back and forth of the charts, it's really hard to see differences. But when you put skin tones in there, you can see, wow, ITU 7 to 9. You can see my skin looks very magenta. And this shirt, which is always very hard to render color-wise, uh, is way off. That's definitely not the color of my shirt. So I never use 709. Next one up is Cinema. Uh, these Now the color of my skin is looking much better. You can see maybe the luminance level of this color right here is a little bit different, but for the most part they look pretty similar. Now 
I only have so many colors into this particular example. When you go outside and you have green grass and blue sky, which are memory colors that everybody knows, um, sometimes you'll see some major differences that you won't see here. But again, for the most part, I've shot inside, outside, studio lights, natural daylight, and still, to me, always looks the most natural. So I'll move on to the next one. Pro, uh, looks like my skin's going a little magenta here. Um, this is, again, another one I do not use. Um, S Gamut. Now again, S Gamut is like Sony's ultra top of the line wide color space. Now what it does is it tries to capture as much of the uh, color gamut as possible, which includes a lot of green. And as you can see here in my face, there's kind of a green tint to it, um, especially when you compare it to still. So we haven't applied any LUT here, and if we did, we could get these colors to go into place. But yeah, as you can see here, these dots like the blue there's two blue dots there's blue all these are all very different from still and even the color of the shirt you can see over here are very different um, so let's move on next one up is movie movie is probably the closest to uh, still and as you can see from the the vector scope the, a lot of these dots are matching perfectly except for blue and the color of the shirt so um, that's also one you could possibly use if you wanted to. They're very, very close to still. And the last one I threw in here was just black and white, um, just for your reference. All right, next up we're going to talk about saturation within the picture profile area. So if you ever need to increase the saturation or decrease it, you have a lot more control here than you do in the creative style. Because the creative style, you only have a few increments, but here we've got, what, 64 different possible values of saturation. Now another thing you can do is go to color depth, go to the blue channel, and you could lower the luminance or the how bright that color is. Um, in the blue channel, we could bring the sky and bring it down like you like I am right here to a positive seven. So you could play around with that instead of using saturation if you wanted to have a more dramatic color of the sky. And what you do basically is you just go into the color depth area, and you could see that we've got the red, green, blue cyan, magenta, and yellow channels that you can also change as well. So a pretty powerful tool if you ever need to. The only time I ever use it is like in this example where I really don't want to increase the saturation of the, the landscape, but I want to just basically bring the blue of the sky down uh, in terms of level, making it appear more saturated, but it actually isn't. All right, next up we're going to be stepping through all the different gamma curves in the picture profile area. Just like last time, we used S-Log2 as a reference, which is this line right here on the waveform monitor. And all the other ones you're going to see are going to be on the left side of that. I've normalized the signal just like last time, so I've stretched basically the highlights and the shadows down on S-Log, so we can kind of see it more of a linear space. So movies first. Um, and as you can see, these are third of a stock increments, so we can see there's quite a bit of contrast right here in the highlights and the midtones. If we move on to the next one, we have still. Uh, you can see it's a little bit different than movie. Both movie and still are pretty close of how they react in terms of the gamma curve. Next one is Cine 1. Now Cine 1 works really well in outdoor or I'd say bright environments. Now Cine 2 I never use, and the reason I never use Cine 2 is I, um, it never records into the super whites. So there's that additional information that we're never getting because it's always being lopped off at 100. So I never use Cine 2 because it just doesn't have as much dynamic range, I, I would believe, just because it doesn't record anything above 100. The next one is Cine 3. I never use this one, but we can see what's happening here. It's starting to brighten up. It's actually above the S-Log2 curve. Uh, and then Cine 4 is similar in the fact that it's even brighter. So Cine 4 works really well in dark situations. As we go back to Cine 1, this is Cine 1, this works well in really uh, more brighter situations. Now the two ITU 709s, there's this one and there's the ITU 709-800. To be honest, I never use these. I Usually if I'm going to use anything, I'm going to usually use Cine 1, um, like I said before, for daylight situations, or I'm going to use Cine 4 in darker situations, and that's pretty much the only two I use uh, besides S-Log. All right, instead of looking at charts, if we look at this kind of low key lighting situation, you'll be able to see the contrast a lot better. Uh, so 
on the left side, none of these, are, no LUTs have been applied, no contrast have been applied. This is straight out of the camera. S-Log2 on the left, and we're gonna change the right side. So this is Cine 1. And as you can tell from here, from the waveform monitor, right here is the, kind of the dividing line between the two. Uh, Cine 1's got a lot more contrast than S-Log2. Go to Cine 2. Again, this is one I don't use um, because it uh, doesn't record in the super whites. Here's Cine 3. As you can see with Cine 3, my forehead um, and the blacks, you can see there's a lot more contrast going on here. Cine 4, um, actually I like probably of all of them, especially in this low key uh, lighting situation, I like what the contrast is doing with my skin tones. So I, again, this is really, the two that I use the most are Cine 1 in more daylight situations, and I use Cine 4 in more darker situations like what you see here. There's ITU 709. Here's Movie, which is very contrast. You can see the blacks are going pretty much almost all the way black, as you can see down here. And we go to Still, and you can see those uh, blacks are getting even more crushed. Again, these are the gamma curves. These are not the color modes, which you might get confused on. I just want to make clarify, these are the gamma curves, not the color modes, even though a lot of these have similar names. This time we're going to step through all the gamma curves in more of this high key environment. We're going to start off with movie. Um, I'm going to keep the exposure all the way through the same. Uh, the color mode is all the same. And starting off with movie, you'll notice that the blue channel is totally clipped out in the sky. And we can see the color of the sky is changing color because we've lost all that blue channel. But as we step through, you'll see that the color of the sky come back as we get uh, less contrasty gamma curves come into play. So let's go ahead and start that. So this is movie. There's still, and as you can see on the scope, you can see it, uh, the sky coming back in. There's Cine 1, Cine 2, Cine 3, Cine 4, ITU 709, ITU 709-800 and just for kicks I threw in a swipe of S-Log2 kind of before and after. Alright, in this example it's not really high key or low key, this is Cine 1. We go to Cine 2, um, again doesn't have super white so I don't use that one. And then Cine 3 is just too contrasty for me so I never use that one either. So there's Cine 4. And like what I said before, I mean, Cine 1 and Cine 4 have their place, but what is this? Is this high key or low key? It's hard to tell. So uh, you might be asking, well, how does like Cine 4 compare to something like neutral, the creative style neutral? So here's a daylight kind of shot with clouds, it's neutral. And then if we look at Cine 4, um, it just doesn't really work that well in terms of contrast in that lighting situation. But if we were to compare it to a low light situation like this, you know, the sun is already set, you can see the lights are in the building, there's neutral. And then when we go to uh, Cine 4, it looks pretty good. Um, and that's, I think, what Cine 4 is really designed for, is more of these low key or getting darker type of situations. All right, next up, we're going to talk about knee. You're going to see that in the picture profile area. Knee it can get you in trouble pretty quick. Um, I would recommend staying away from it and leaving it on auto for each one. Uh, so you can go in and actually change the mode from auto to manual. And then once you're in there, you can actually take the manual and change the slope. Like for what I'm gonna show the demonstration purposes here, I've taken the slope down to a negative five. And then what I'm doing is I'm bringing down the point at which the slope tar starts to be affected. Now what I want you to watch for is right here up where my mouse, mouse is rotating these clouds that are right up here. These clouds down here won't get affected but right up here and as you're gonna hear me step through it as we go along so here we go. 102, 100, 97, 95, 92, 90, 87, 85, 82. Right there. I don't know if you heard me. I said 82. And 82 is right here in the clouds where you start to see it. Um, the crowd, clouds basically going to lose definition and detail. So watch. Let's as we go, continue a little bit farther. 80. 77. 75. Then back, back to 105. So you can see 
there's a, a large difference in the clouds. If you're thinking of using slope to maybe recover highlights or do something like that, I've tried this exercise many times um, and it usually does more harm than good. So I would recommend staying away from knee. There's so many different things that we have available to us from Cine 1 through Cine 4. All these things treat the clouds differently. I would recommend that you actually go in and use the Cine 1 through Cine 4 to get the clouds that you want rather than playing around the knee because you're probably going to... What I found is you're not going to see these clouds go gray like they do here because you're going to be concentrating something else in the frame. And then later on, you'll be going back and like, oh, I lost all definition of the clouds because I played with the knee. So I'd recommend just bouncing around the different picture profiles rather than trying to adjust the knee. All right, next up, we're going to talk about some items I have not covered yet in the picture profiler. And it can go pretty deep. <laughs> Believe me, let's take an example of that. We're going to go all the way to the bottom and we're going to look at detail. Think of detail as sharpness. Um, let's just actually stay on level and I'll show you what it does basically. Keep an eye on the text right there. And as I pass up, you can see it's getting sharper. And then boom, it gets duller. And then it gets sharper again. So basically it's, um, this area is kind of like, I'd say sharpening on steroids. They call it detail. I believe it uses the same algorithm because I've compared the re you know results of zero here versus zero uh, in the creative style area. And they look really, really similar. Now, what's happening here is you've got an adjust and you can change it from auto, which I wouldn't recommend doing because there's some things going on behind the scenes that works incredibly well, such as the clear image zoom. As you zoom into something uh, past the optical part of the power zoom on the, like the 18 to 105 and you go into more of a digital zoom, it's doing some pretty fancy algorithm stuff for sharpening and textures and what it sees. I would leave it on auto because it's such a great job. But if you're pretty picky about your sharpening, you could go to manual and you could then go in and change some of these things. Now, to be honest, a lot of these things aren't explained very well in the manual and I have no idea exactly what they are. Uh, v slash H balance in the manual says it basically sets the vertical and horizontal balance of detail. So let's go ahead and just take a look, demo it. As I step through, can you see any difference in that text that's written in the colors? So that's the first one. Uh, B slash W, which you would think might stand for black and white balance. Um, there's all these different types that you can choose from. Uh, really good question because the manual just says um, selects the balance of the lower detail B and the upper detail W. Well, what does that mean? Is that black and white or what is exactly that does it do? And as you can see, as I cursor around in this text, you can see it get um, sharper right here and duller or it changes in a way, but the default uh, that I believe is, I think it's set at uh, type three. All right, next up is limit. This one's a little bit confusing. In the manual, it says sets the limit level of detail. Um, if you go into it, it says basically zero is the low limit level, meaning it's likely to be limited. Whereas if we go to seven, it's um, unlikely to be limited. It's a little confusing because all right, if I go back up to this mode and I'm in auto, does that mean it's limiting the level right here? Yeah, it's a little bit on the confusing side. Again, I haven't used these that much because um, the sharpness works so well, I typically don't even um, bother changing it here. So I'm gonna let's go back to manual. All right, next up is crisping. Uh, I think it's supposed to have an E between the P and the N because that's the way it is in the manual. It basically says sets the crisping level. Um, zero is shallow crisping and seven is deep. So I guess how crispy the image is. So let's go ahead and try it out. As we go up and you can see if there's any sort of difference as we step through. And the last one is highlight detail. It says sets the detail level in the high intensity areas, zero through four. So let's see what this one does. So again, I just want to say that I typically will, since I use power zooms and I use the clear image zoom, um, I won't adjust anything here, but I will, if I need to, I'll adjust it here. And most of the time, to be honest, like I told, talked about in the creative styles, I just left that sharpening at zero. Same thing here, detail, I just leave it zero. 
uh, I find that it matches really well to the zero on the creative style side of things. So I don't do much there. All right, we've already talked about color depth, um, color phase. The best way I can do this is really demonstrate it to you. So I'm gonna have to actually switch this out of HDMI. Hold on, I'll be right back in a second. I switched out the HDMI so you can actually see the Shogun screen, which shows the um, vector scope. And this is the best way I can really show you what happens with color phase. So right now, there is a bunch of numbers on the back of the camera which you can't see, but basically it goes from zero to like plus, I believe seven or minus seven. So I'm gonna step through each one, you can see what happens. So right now we're at zero, we're gonna to go to plus one. See how it just rotated to the right? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then it goes to a negative seven. So there's plus seven, negative seven. And we step up, so we're gonna negative six, negative five, negative four, negative three, negative two, negative one, and zero. So basically what you're seeing, it's just shifting the hue. Um, it's it's basically spinning <laughs> the colors around, which uh, maybe you could try, but if you're trying to get accurate colors off the bat by doing this, um, you'll probably forget about the setting the next time you go and you, all your colors will be off. So this is a very dangerous one to change. All right, next up is black gamma. And in the manual, it basically says, uh, corrects gamma in low intensity areas, what the manual says. So let's go take a look and see what it actually does. Um, you could change the range, and I've tried this many times, narrow, middle. I'm not saying that doesn't make a difference, but most of the time I've never noticed any difference. Um, and basically the manual just says, selects the corrected range. It tells me a lot. <laughs> but basically, let's go ahead and I'll show you, I'll demonstrate what actually happens. So here we are. Look at the uh, waveform monitor and basically watch what happens between like, I don't know, 40 uh, IRE and lower. Everything above I'd say maybe 40 is not really being affected as I cycle through all these numbers. So that's basically what's happening to your black level. It's just bringing the black levels down, which, you know, and you know, if you're having S log and you wanted to bring black, black levels down, you could, you're kind of defeating the purpose of S log in a way, or some of the Cine one through Cine fours. Um, to be honest, like I talked about before, I'd really keep these at the default level because we have so many gamma curves that we can cycle through. Maybe the last thing you want to do is screw around with some of these other items, forget that you screwed around with them, and then later on you, know, you film something and it doesn't look correct. All right, black level. This is our last one in the uh, picture profile area that we haven't discussed yet. And it's one that's the most mysterious to me because in the manual it says, sets the black level. <laughs> that's all it says. So let's go take a look to see what it does. And I definitely have stuff that's black in the frame. Um, I can't seem to find if there's any sort of auto or manual setting, but watch what happens. Watch the waveform monitor. Yeah, I'm cycling through and it's doing absolutely nothing. And I definitely have stuff in the frame that is black. Um, so it's definitely not working here. So one of the things I want to try is let's get out of S-Log and go to one of the most contrasty ones we've got here, and that's movie. Um, and then we'll go back to black level and see what if anything changes. And sure enough, boom, you see what happened there? Um, it didn't do anything in S-Log, and it doesn't talk about this in the manual, but it's basically doing the same thing as Black Gamma. Um, but it's now doing it to more of the linear uh, picture, because perhaps there was nothing below, I don't know, what it, maybe 10 IRE uh, in S-Log 2, but there is in this particular Gamma curve. So you can definitely see what's happening here. Not only is it stretching the blacks, but it's affecting even way up there at around, what, 80 IRE. So it's doing it's doing a lot of stuff there. So again, here's something, you know, maybe you don't want to change the black level. Maybe you want to change, just leave it at zero because as you change between something that's more linear, like movie, to something that's more like S-Log, uh, it's gonna change and change a lot. That is pretty much the end of our picture profile and S-Log section.